All right, let's get on with it. A brand new Flyers Daily for Halloween 2023. Flyers Daily presented by Ticketmaster. Make more memories live. Flyers also teaming up with Penn Medicine for the Penn Medicine Assist. And that means for every Flyers Assist this season, Penn Medicine and the Flyers are going to be donating 30 pounds of food to local communities in need. Flyers Canes last night and Similar to the Las Vegas Golden Knights game, albeit that one was on the road, uh, the Flyers fall in pretty late fashion to the Carolina Hurricanes uh, by a similar score, same score, three to two. Uh, both of those games are against what I think are two of the top teams in the NHL. I'd probably say top five when you look at Las Vegas. Obviously, they've gotten off to a great start this year, won the cup last year. Carolina, one of those perennial cup teams as well. And they both resemble each other in the sense that they both have tremendous depth. When you look at uh, a guy like Shvachnikov playing on the fourth line, now he is not a fourth line player. It's only a second game of the season. But when you look at a guy like that playing on a fourth line, that's a team with pretty darn good depth. All said and done, though, Flyers uh, fall after getting outshot 33-28. to 28. They uh, actually outhit Carolina in the game 19-11. to 11. A lot of that was in the first period. I think the Flyers out hit them 11 to three in the first, but that's because Carolina owned the puck. Sometimes that number tells you who has the puck more by the team with more hits doesn't have the puck as much. And that was the case early in this hockey game as well. Flyers went on the power play five times, went over five and Carolina went on the power play just once and capitalized. The power play has got to be more effective for the Flyers. They're not a team that has got, a ton of goal scorers on it. So scoring on the man advantage needs to be something that they they have success at with more frequency than they do now. They've been better of late, but 0 for 5 in this game, to me, is a very key stat why they didn't come away with the win. Now, that being said, in the third period of this game, they go in tied at 2. They threw everything and anything at Freddie Anderson in that third period of that game. I thought it was one of the best periods they've played this entire season. I'd put the Canucks second period in there as well, where they outshot the Vancouver Canucks. I think it was the 23 to three in that second period. They've had some good periods, but in this one coming in, in a tie game, they really threw a lot at Carolina and Brian Smith and I, when we were talking at the second intermission heading into that third, we were saying for, the Flyers to have a chance here. Carter Hart's probably going to have to make some saves he shouldn't make, and he did. He made some unbelievable stops at his end of the ice as well. Problem was, is that Freddie Anderson also did that, and then eventually uh, the Flyers get caught, and Tavo Te Teravainen is able to be right in the middle of the ice, and Flyers were sagged a little too deep as Carolina, with their pressure, um, got them to sag a little deep, and Teravainen with a perfect shot off the bar, beat Hart, and that's the game winner. Uh, the scoring opened up in the first period, 3-11 in when uh, Stefan Nosen picked up his second goal of the season. And it's one where, you know, he gets the pass from across, from Shvechnikov, and he's on Hart's blocker side. And Carter gets there. Carter gets to his spot in the square, but Nosen kind of fumbled the puck initially and then got a delayed shot off. And as that happened, Hart's got to put his right skate into the ice to prevent him from overshooting the position. And when he does that, that all of a sudden causes the inertia to raise the pad up just a little bit, and Nosen gets a throw. Um, so had he got the shot off initially, I think all holes were covered. But because there was a little delay in him getting the puck off his stick, Hart's got to dig that foot in so he doesn't overshoot the position moving from his left to his right. Anyway, it ends up behind them. It's one nothing Carolina. Flyers answer at 15.09. Owen Tippett picks up his second goal of the season, jumps off the bench, breaks up a play in the neutral zone, good neutral zone position, and goes right back to transition onto offense. This is a big difference, I think, in this Flyers team, is that ability to cause the turnover in the neutral zone through decisive and good defensive play and then get right back on the attack. And that's what Owen Tippett does here. He gets the puck off the turnover, gets it to Sean Couturier, 
and then gets on his horse and gets moving up the ice. Couturier finds him. He goes in. He beats Freddie Anderson. Kind of on a shot that, frankly, was rolling a little bit, and he flubbed as well. So kind of a change-up. Next, uh, the Flyers at 18-23. They gain the 2-1 lead when Garnet Hathaway picks up his first. This all starts in the Flyers' end. Nick Delarier makes a huge clean body check in the corner in the D zone on a Carolina Hurricane player, causes the play to go the other way. Nick Delarier eventually in the offensive zone finds Garnet Hathaway for his first goals, a flyer who's camped out right in front of the net. And Hathaway doesn't just fly by the net. He goes to the net, stops, and eventually gets rewarded. Delarier and Lawton centering that fourth line uh, pick up the assist. So the Flyers, I thought they got outplayed in the first period, but they come out with a 2 1 lead. Sometimes you outplay the opposition and you come out trailing. That's just hockey, but they'll take it. It's 2 1 after 1. Only goal of the second period comes on the power play for Carolina when Michael Bunting scores. He gets the power play goal. So we head to the third period with the game tied at two. Let's go back to that bunting goal real quick because that's another one. It's right off a draw in the Flyers' D zone as Carolina's on the power play. And there's a battle. Sometimes we look at face-off wins and face-off losses, and we focus really exclusively on the center. But a lot of times, a a face-off being won or lost is not determined by the center. Sometimes you win it clean, you win it right back to your defenseman, and it's obvious. Other times, it's a five-man unit off the face-off, and the wingers have to do the right things as well. It's why you see the center talking to the wingers or the D before a lot of draws, kind of tipping them as to what he's trying to accomplish. In this situation, the faceoff's kind of a 50-50, but the Flyers winger loses the battle on a kind of a bouncing puck in a tied-up situation, and it ends up on the stick of Stefan Nosen, who then gets it to Michael Bunting. He one-times it, but he kind of fans on it a little bit too, so it's a little bit of a change-up. So you're seeing, a, I mean, if you were to equate three of the goals in this game, the typical, the first Nosen goal, and the Michael Bunting goal, they were all like, in baseball terminology, you would call it junk. They were all thro- junk thrown at them. You know, not they were all off speed and movement. <laughs> and those are hard for a goaltender. But that ties the game. We headed to the third period. All to play for in the third period in a tie game. Flyers carried a lot of the play in that third period. Like I said before, getting tremendous amounts of pressure on Freddie Anderson. He made some unbelievable saves on the Flyers to keep them off the board. And Flyers kept pushing and kept pushing. The third period was incredibly entertaining and, you know, well goaltended hockey and up and down the ice and big plays at both ends and great saves and good scoring chances and the the you know the crowd rising as threats were either against or threats were for and it was a wild third period but unfortunately at 16 13 uh inside the final four minutes uh, that's where Tavo Teravine found a little bit of space in the high slot and then was able to beat Hart and uh, really beat them with a, just a really good shot off the bar and in. And there's your final three to two. It's one of those games where there's a lot of things you can take from it. You don't like the result, just like the Vegas game. But you stood in there like they did with Vegas, toe-to-toe with I, what I think is a really good team. Now, Carolina has been a little uneven to begin the season. Saw some traits in them coming in. They've d- dealing with some injuries, Pesci. And obviously, you know, you look at, a guy like uh, Shvechnikov, who's only played his second game. I mean, they came into this game having given up five goals once, six goals once, seven goals once, and four goals. The third most goals allowed per game is played this season. And they're a team that, over the prior three seasons, gave up the second least amount of goals. So you knew that was a little bit out of character for the Carolina Hurricanes. But the last two games going into the Flyers game, we started to see the traits of the Carolina Hurricanes in a Rod Brindamore coach team. They beat Seattle 3-2 in overtime. They beat San Jose 3-0, starting to lock it down more and show the traits of being the team that they've been the prior three seasons and one that is certainly going to be a handful for everybody coming up uh, throughout this season and uh, into the postseason. They've got a lot of depth as well, and they're a team that's not built on any one guy getting 130 points and carrying the offense. I mean, their leading point getter last year had 69 points. 
So it's not one of those teams like the Oilers where McDavid racks up 135 and then they get to the playoffs and they all look at McDavid and go, can you give us more? Now, they're a team that's very well balanced and a team uh, that will throw it at you in waves, which is very similar to the Las Vegas Golden Knights. And as we go through this rebuild, that's one of the things, you know, you got to look at. You look at, okay, we're in a rebuild, but what are we trying to build? Are we trying to build a team that uh, has that depth, has that ability to to roll four lines at you and has the ability to get pretty consistent scoring from three lines and occasionally from your fourth line and can lock down a game with a good defensive unit? How are we trying to build this thing? Because you can go, we can build it for regular season success, you know, like the Toronto Maple Leafs have or the Edmonton Oilers have. But ultimately, success is what you do in the playoffs. And those teams have not had tremendous playoff success. They've got great players. Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, Austin Matthews, Mitch Marner are all great players. But are they built to win in the playoffs? And ultimately, is that what matters? It's great for a team to be a wagon in the regular season, but ultimately you're going to be a team that's going to be able to click through best of seven rounds in the playoffs and put yourself in a position to win the cup. And I just don't know that those teams are built that way. Plus the other element of it is this, you know, having star players and Carolina's got some star players. I mean, they got guys like, like Brent Burns has been around forever, but they've got Tara Vinen, who's got eight goals on the season, the same second in the NHL along with Travis Konechny. They've got guys like Shvechnikov, who's a dynamic talent. They've got a guy in Sebastian Ajo that's a great all-around player. But he's not a guy that's going to command north of $12 million a season. And in a salary cap league, can you build a team when you're playing one or two players such a high percentage of the cap? Because you've got to build a team that's got depth. You've got to build a team that can have good goaltending and defensive depth. And under a salary cap system, you just can't – it's really difficult for those teams to do it. You you have to take the money that you pay a super global superstar like McDavid or Matthews. The money comes from somewhere. You've got to then go thin somewhere else. So can you build a team in today's NHL when you're paying a player that much percentage of cap? We'll see. You know, this game has always been predicated on depth. and. You need depth in the playoffs because of the war of attrition that it is. So um, Carolina, though, a team that, you know, wasn't built through tanking, even though, you know, Shvechnikov's the number two overall pick. Uh, they've made some really savvy selections later in the draft, and that's why they are what they are. And they're incredibly well coached by a guy in Rod Brindamore that his non-negotiables are very similar to John Tortorella's. You know, you're going to either play hard or you're not going to play. You're going to do things the right way or you're not going to play. Can't have you around. You know, John Tortorella calls it a standard. I don't know what Rob Brindamore calls it, but what they are is coaching non-negotiables. And you, they're, they're unchallengeable. And it's just the way it is. Fall in line or else you got to go. Now, one of the other storylines in the game last night was obviously the return of Morgan Frost. Gets back into the lineup, just his third game of the season uh, after sitting for six straight games. I thought he showed well in the game. Uh, I thought he was a little rusty in the faceoff circle. It's not something you work on in practices and, you know, can can really prepare for. He had a rough night in the in the circle. Flyers did overall. Had a pretty rough night in the circle. Carolina won 70% of the faceoffs. I mean, that's a huge number. Uh, but all said and done, Morgan Frost ended up with three shots on goal, 17.02 in ice time. 435 on the power play and in 24 shifts played with Travis Konechny. I thought he made some plays, created some opportunity, Thought he was good in the D zone. So I, I thought for his first game back, I thought it was a fine performance from Morgan Frost. And for in this game, it was at the first time, I think this entire season that Travis Sanheim did not lead the Flyers in average time on ice or time on ice. Sanheim played a lot. 23 minutes and 23 seconds. But Cam York actually played 23 minutes and 50 seconds. So I think that might be the first time somebody else has gotten more minutes than Travis Sanheim. Maybe it's a matchup thing. I'm not sure. York had one more shift than Sanheim. Maybe that's just something in the way it played out. York played 
five minutes and two seconds on the power play. Sanheim played 451. So that's pretty close to your difference right there. Both played, Sanheim played 34 seconds shorthanded. You were played 35. But still pretty close. We're splitting hairs. Uh, and uh, Leading the way for the Flyers in offensive minutes uh, wasn't Sean Couturier either. It was actually Travis Konechny who played 20 minutes and 20 seconds. Couturier played 20 minutes and 10 seconds. So again, we're splitting hairs. But look, you can take some things out of this game. Got to move into Wednesday against the Buffalo Sabres tomorrow night at Wells Fargo Center to wrap up the four-game homestand. First of a home-and-home, home, which as we know, a home-and-home home always creates a little scar tissue for that second game. Flyers will look to uh, get back in the wing column coming up tomorrow against Buffalo. It's got a lot of talent. Buffalo's got a lot of talent, but they're not off to a great start. They're sitting in the bottom spot in the Atlantic Division of the uh, Eastern Conference. So that's tomorrow. But everybody, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. We'll talk to you tomorrow when we preview Flyers Sabres on a brand new Flyers Daily.